Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Wednesday the 9th of September 2015 and joining me on this edition are Assistant Editor Steve Withers. Why? Do I smell baby oil? And audio reviewer Ed Silly. Hey guys, they got a tank. And everybody else went sick. Uh, welcome back to the AV Forums podcast. <laughs> it is the IFA special. Uh, but before we get all uh, German on you, I think it's time to uh, see what the competitions are, Ed, and okay. uh, who the winners were. Fine, right. Current competitions, Lawrence of Arabia Blu-ray. That's running until the 14th of September. So you'll need to get a shift on after listening to the podcast, but not, not you know, drop everything this minute. Well worth doing. I mean, let's face it, that's a cracker of a film. And as I understand it, it, it it's, you know, it's, it's a good the, disc in its own right as well. Oh, the Blu-ray is a work of uh, absolute encoding genius. It looks stunning. Well, yeah, there you really go. Good. You can't say fairer than that. So get in, get entering that one. But then also... 14th of September, Little Shop of Horrors, 1986. What a film. On Blu-ray as well. have no idea what the transfer is like, but you shouldn't care about that. It's a great film, and it would be an option opportunity to get it for free. So 14th of September, get yourself entering that one as well. We've even got some previous competition with, uh, winners um, as well. Uh, the War of the Roses Blu-ray was won by the magnificently named Pig Whistler. Good man. I like that. And the uh, Thermal Take PC Gaming Bundle, courtesy of Scan, was uh, won by Miss Chief. So congratulations to you both. In, enjoy enjoy your prizes. C- clever play and what's there? Yeah, yeah. What can I say? But, but we need to stress, we do not choose the username simply if you're named something hilarious like Pig Oh, no, Whistler. no, no. It, no so it's, it's completely, it completely, uh, it's completely random. random, but yeah, Pig Whistler. But yeah. we're pleased that they were good, good on, names yeah. as well. <laughs> Uh, right, so let's move on to what we saw last week. Um, all three of us were at IFA, but at different times, because Ed managed to have... Well, you were there when Carryverse was on sale, and uh, me and Steve looked all over and had to end up... Oh, no, up, no, but... I had Carryverse on the Friday film. Oh, you bastard. It was public day, wasn't it, by then? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you were fun. only here for, like, one day, basically, that's what you're going to get, really. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, you had to work while I was uh, putting my slippers on back home. Um, so, Ed, uh, you were there over the weekend looking at Hi-Fi and so on, so we'll come back to you in a second. I think you had a good look around this. I, I mean, got to see, I don't get me wrong, I will be able to contribute in my own basically meaningless way to some of these headline items in the in the itinerary. I went to have a look at them myself. So, yeah, don't worry. I, I, I did look at other things, but yeah. And so. obviously we'll be coming back to you for uh, for the White Goods Roundup as well. Of as, course, as although as well I, as... Stra- I need to forewarn you, I, such was my dedication to finding the more interesting audio things at IFA. I spent far less time on the white goods floor than ideally I should have. I would have wanted. Um, I feel uh, I'm not fully up to speed with the latest in what fridges are offering in 2015. So please don't ask me because I'm afraid I don't know. Okay, um, let's leave the big talking points at the moment um, because I know we're going to talk about them in quite some detail. So let's quickly go through a few of the things. Now, the biggest surprise of the show for me um, was the complete and utter lack of uh, Ultra Blu-ray, Ultra HD Blu-ray uh, announcement, Steve. Um, something I know that you were crying into your hanky about. Um, it looks like Samsung was the only one to announce a actual player with a model number and not a prototype like other people. And... Um, that's about it. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be seeing it for Christmas. No, I think actually at the show, the BDA did, did come clean and say, yeah, we're not going to make Christmas. So they're looking at a big launch, um, I, I guess it's at CES in January, going to be hitting the stores uh, in the US in January. And they told me it'll be arriving um, in Europe early spring. So I'm going to say March as a guess. Um, if that's their definition of it, that would be um, my definition I, I, of early spring. So. I think I think mine's will be never. No, 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 no. They it's can't. They can't miss many more. They don't have a lot of choice here. No. Why, why, why'd you say never? I, I, I don't think the studios are interested. I think this is. Well, if, Pat, everybody's Fox definitely are. Well, <laughs> they seem uh, to be all over like a cheap suit for some reason. Ah, uh, it just it's you know it's already slipped one. Let's wait and see. Yeah, I don't think anyone really thought they were going to make Christmas, did they? I didn't. Yes, it, you it seemed did. like a strange <laughs> thing to do. You know, why not? <laughs> well, if you look at D- DVD and Blu-ray they, and HD DVD, they all launched in March. Uh, of oh, is this? Is this? <laughs> so. In the interests of continuity, if nothing else. Oh, you really are. You know, you're grabbing on anything at the minute. Aren't you? Oh, March. Yeah, yeah, it'll be March, not Christmas. <laughs> No, I mean, I was talking to the guy from from Twenty Century Fox, and he he said, you know, yeah, it'll be. Uh, we've, we've been doing, we've been planning this for a long time. They've been doing 4K restorations of their <laughs> movies for at least the last three years. Yeah, but they couldn't hit the deadline. 
They've been playing it a long time, but they didn't. Yeah, I know, but when you talk to the BDA, it's like, yeah, but you know, people need to understand that this is a long, complex process. So, so, why, of... so why did they say it'll be ready for Christmas if they knew it wasn't going to be ready for Christmas because it's a long... I guess keep people interested. Then. <laughs> um, I've got to say, the, the Samsung Blu-ray player, the H- Ultra HD Blu-ray player, it may have a model number, but I don't think it was any more of a working model than the one that <laughs> the Panasonic was showing. Uh, I mean, it, it, on the display itself, it was, there, were, there were two players there, but I mean, they weren't... Um, could, 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 you pick, could you pick them up and shake them? Um, yeah, they were solid. I mean, I, I didn't actually touch them. I didn't want to set off any alarms or something like that. Some sort of screen to come crashing down around me. And... What do you mean you didn't stroke it? No. I mean, I mean if you, anyone who... Um, well, well, they'll get a look at them uh, later this week in detail in videos and in a um, uh, written piece. But they're, um, they are curved. Uh, obviously, uh, sounds enough curves on the brain these days. But it's only a slight curve. They're basically pretty simple looking. And they're just black plastic players with a few buttons on the front, a tray, a display. At the back, there is a power socket, a LAN port, an optical digital output, and an HDMI 2.0A output. And that's it. Um, at least that was all, all that was on the um, prototypes that were on display. Spec-wise, they listed the specs, and they were what you'd expect to see. It didn't mention about color space, I have to say, in, in, on the actual specs listed by the player. But you know, it had, if, if it um, comes to market, it'll be 7 or 9 to start with. You reckon? Yeah. But yeah, I think I think we're going to see big announcements. Actually, which is good. I, and you all, can and start singing like launch- Journey at you now. Don't stop <laughs> believing me. It looks like they'll be launching them as uh, 4K Blu-ray and with a Blu-ray in there as well, which is quite handy. So, sorry, say that again. I mean, I when think they, it means it will come with a disc rather yeah, than like random, randomly leaving a copy of something <laughs> random in the tray. <laughs> uh, they'll be, they'll be, like the way they do at the moment with like, you get a Blu-ray and you also get the HD, uh, the, the DVD of the film. Yeah, I was going to say, you won't get the HD DVD of the no. film. <laughs> yeah, Ultra HD Blu-ray plus a Blu-ray. So, For those that haven't quite made the transition yet, at least have it there for them at some point in the future. We need a better name. Ultra HD Blu-ray is such a tongue twister. I, I think uh, I, I'm, more, I'm certainly a lot more uh, hopeful now than I was before the show. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it comes to fruition, Steve, just it for your sake. Worse. Imagine if we got to the end of the show and there hadn't been the announcement from Samsung or from 2070 Fox. That would have been like, oh, right, we really aren't going to get anything, are we? Well, well we, we knew we were going to get something because you'd set up meetings, obviously, with the UHD Alliance and so on. But the, the fact that there was nothing at the Panasonic press conference, I thought, mm, that's odd. You know, founding member of the BDA. Then we had the Sony press conference and they said nothing. And you're thinking... Okay, the other founding member of the BDA, what the hell's happening? And it takes Samsung to come up with something. Oh, don't forget that Samsung actually did release the very first Blu-ray player. I had, so, for, I had forgotten that, yeah. No, they did. They, they released the very, very first Blu-ray player. Not counting the PS3, but the very first standalone Blu-ray player. I bought it. You were the only one that bought in a Blu-ray then? <laughs> no, I both. I, I was hedging my bets. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, we'll wait and see. Um, I, I, I guess if the Miss CES... They're in trouble. I mean, CES is, they have to hit CES. Yeah, and they, ha- yeah, they have they've to got, hit they've got, they've got to get that sorted yeah. out. That, that's the obvious place. To, I mean, to be honest, if you're thinking about it, if I was thinking about it, logically, you could say, well, you want to manage stores for Christmas, but really, you want a big splash first, and, and CES will see the, like, the obvious place to do it. Um, and, yeah, and I, I guess Ron Martin seemed to be quite chipper about that as well. So, you know, from a Panasonic point of view, it seems to be that they're ready to go. They're just waiting on content. So, um, yeah, we'll wait and see, I think. The, the, the surprising thing is always Sony, you know, <laughs> the one oh, consumer oh, electronics understand. company that has a full professional department and also a film studio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they they can never seem to tie everything together um, and, and get it out there. It seems really strange. Anyway, let's move on. Let's stay with Sony then. Let's go to projectors. That's the next, uh, the next big thing that I want to talk about because... Um, well, certainly I saw this Sony. You had a look at the new JVC. Uh, let's talk Sony first. It's a 520 that replaces the 500. It's going to be around about the same price. This is the one that uh, really appeals because it has HDR. It's also got HDMI 2.0A, um, HDCP uh, 2.2, and uh, this is the one that we had the demonstration of. Got to say, really quite impressive. It was a completely blacked out room, um, which you really have to have with the Sony SXRDs and the JVCs to get the, the full appreciation on what they can do hdr on there but i felt yes it was good but it wasn't in your face good it was really quite a relaxed effect and i could see quite a few people being disappointed with that steve yes including me in all honesty i don't think they chose the best demo clip to be fair to to really demonstrate uh 
the potential of HDR. It was a, a scene from uh, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, um, the scene where Spider-Man, if you've seen the film, where Spider-Man fights with um, Electro for the first time in Times Square. Um, and there were bits and pieces where you thought, okay, yeah, that's uh, that looks... Yeah, there's a bit more dynamic range to that, but I wasn't. I was. I still wasn't blown away by. It. I wasn't thinking like, "Oh my god, that looks." I mean, unlike some of the TV demos that we've seen, where I do think, "Blimey, that looks good," that wasn't quite as impressive. Obviously, we're talking about projectors, so they don't have anywhere near kind of the overall brightness you're going to get from um, from a, from a TV uh, or in terms of peak brightnesses. Um, but it, it, as we always keep saying, it's about dynamic range. It's not about just being bright. It's about a range between dark and light. And obviously, to achieve that on the on the SXRDs, they use because um, their blacks aren't the native blacks aren't as good as JVC, so they tend to use uh, dynamic irises. There isn't a dynamic iris on the three hundred three twenty, but there is on the five twenty. I could see it in operation. Nothing about you, Phil, but definitely when they were, shoot, they were showing a sequence from the TV series Blacklist in four uh, K. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, you know, it looked overly detailed. <laughs> <laughs> it was know, being, it, they had know, the processing on a bit too yeah, much. Yeah, and I know it's a strange thing to say about a native four K projector, but when you see in, you know skin pores and and lines and wrinkles and stuff in there, they were so pronounced. And also, I, I found the motion in that scene. You know, it's supposed to be a drama scene, a very high end video look. I think again they had on they had on frame interpolation, didn't they? And uh, it was it was definitely a lot of processing going on. Obviously, we would recommend if you were setting up one of those projectors to turn all that stuff off. Uh, I personally turn off the time occurrence as well, but um, that's me. I mean, it looked it looked good. I mean, it was on a very big screen, wasn't it? And we were sat very close, uh, and it held up well. Um, but I, I, it's, you know, it's still, it's still quite expensive. I mean, eight grand is not cheap. No, I've got to say the HDR. Um, it was a step up over over the SDR demo that they run. I don't think the material was very good. I think what they were trying to get at was the gradation in the blacks, which were very good. It doesn't quite have the 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 dyna- dynamic. Um, black to it. The, the J- you know, the JVC has this black that you can, you can never really describe. I always find it difficult. And I've only ever really seen blacks like that, um, to, you know, once or twice uh, on other, other devices. Um, but I thought the detail was great. I thought there was definitely a layered uh, performance to it, but it was so um, laid back. It wasn't like jumping out of the screen. Um, like you say, you would get on a on a flat panel but then you got to, you know, you've already mentioned it. You got to remember, a flat panel is going to be kicking out seventy foot Lambert, whereas mm. that screen was probably pushing sixteen at the most. Yeah, that's sixteen one six. Um, so there is a difference there, um, and it's all about dynamic range. And it had a fair dynamic range to it. It looked okay, but I think people going into that demo and expecting to see what HDR looks like on a flat panel on a projector, yeah, there's going to be disappointment there because it it doesn't quite have that pop about it. What what um what surprised me, and I think what Sony were doing was they were very much coasting with those projectors because what they are essentially are the same. They're slightly brighter, particularly in the case of the uh, uh, five twenty. It's slightly brighter than the previous generation, obviously to help push the dynam- high dynamic range aspect. But basically, they, they look like they're the same projectors with HTCP two point two and HDMI two point zero. Which, which brings us on to JVC because that's exactly what JVC are doing. Although you know they're not moving into the native area. And I guess the, the reason for that is they've had a very short time to bring these projectors to market. And I'm not sure if listeners are aware, but obviously JVC was bought out by Kenwood recently. And there was a lot of uh, internal restructuring and all that kind of thing. So to bring the projectors to market, they've had to stay with the same chassis. They've had to stay roughly with the same technology, but there are tweaks here and there. And I guess it's kind of what Sony have done. Like you say, I mean, they're only slight increments on, on the outgoing models. Yeah, they are. I mean, it's understandable. I mean, if you look at Sony, they have clearly invested a lot of money in 4K, both in terms of televisions, but also in terms of projection, both uh, domestic and professional. And of course, they also make cameras. And as you said at the beginning, Phil, they even own a, a studio. So they're very invested in 4K. And I'm sure they spend a fortune and they are essentially trying to muscle in on that market as much as possible, particularly when it comes to projectors through their line of native 4K. Projectors. And they are currently still the only consumer manufacturer to offer native 4k but i think to a certain extent they're kind of coasting on the back of the fact that they have got that aspect and they aren't really pushing anything else so the, yes there's a hdr with the 520 but they were pretty vague about exactly what the hdmi 2.0 um inputs could handle they aren't dci color space or they can't handle dci color space they are 10 bit but there's a i got this feeling that like they aren't really pushing the technology as far as they could be considering the price point particularly at least i got the feeling that jvc whilst admitting to the fact that they don't have a native 4k panel 
yet because that requires time and a lot of money, I suspect. They have at least tried to push every other aspect because we've been talking about this for a long time now. It's not just about increased, you know, more pixels. It's about better pixels. It's about creating an experience that isn't just higher resolution but adds other things to it. And if JVC are to be believed from their demonstration, you know, they've got 10-bit HDR support and, and also DCI along with their eShift device, which means that they can project to a higher resolution than just full HD. So although it's not native 4K, the resolution does look higher than, than just full HD in the demo that they showed me, or demos that they showed me. And, and, and that was the case last year as well with the previous models, which could accept a 4K signal. They didn't have HD CP 2.2. They started off with a demo of the X5000, showing some 4K content, 4K HD CP 2.2 content. In fact, just to prove it did actually work. And I thought it looked really good. I mean, it was clearly high resolution than Full HD. It looked fantastic. I mean, okay, I appreciate it wasn't completely native 4K, but I still thought it looked really good. In fact, at one point I asked them, "That is, is that the 5,000 or the 9,000 you're showing me? I thought it looked that good. Then they did the 9,000 with a Blu-ray, um, a scene from Gravity, and that looked absolutely spectacular. This was just straight standard, standard Blu-ray, but with the increased brightness on those projectors, plus those deep blacks, the dynamic range within a normal image was impressive. Um, it just had real punch to it. Then they did an HDR demo using the actual short film they'd obviously probably commissioned themselves. Uh, they showed it in uh, in um, they showed the little short film in standard standard dynamic range first, and then they showed it again in HDR. Unlike the Sony demo, you could clearly see stuff uh, in the HDR footage that wasn't there. Particularly things like skies. In the skies, you know, there was detail in the clouds and in things like that. Or in, um, wooden floors this girl was standing on in the, in, the, in the film you just couldn't really see that in the standard definition version but you could clearly see it in the HDR version so same issues as the Sony of course it's a projector it's not a TV so it hasn't got that overall brightness but certainly it was able to, to deliver detail in blacks and in there was a scene where she was walking along at night uh, along a um, a gantry, a sort of walkway, a steel walkway, um, and again, you know, there was there was that sense of um, of depth and, and range to the image and detail within the blacks that you weren't getting before. I thought I was very impressed. You know, given the pricing, that uh, now this was the five thousand and the nine thousand they were demonstrating, but I think the sweet spot really in terms of performance and price is going to be the seven thousand, because that's going to be what about five five and a half grand, Phil. Yep. Putting it head to head with the VW three twenty. Yeah, and of course the VW three twenty, it might be native four K, but it misses out on a number of features. Yeah, one of the main ones for me definitely <laughs> is uh, the lens memory function. Um, it loses out on that mm. at that price point, and if you've got a two three five screen like like we have, a bit of a pain in the neck, even though it's a native four K. Yeah, so although um, although there were no, there were no new JVC projectors last year, and I think some people Sorry, were disappointed Steve. to find out. Sorry, Steve, I just wanted to, I just wanted to pick up there. Um, before we go on, so uh, we were talking about the 320 against the 5000. Um, the 5000, it does HDR? Yes, it does. It does support HDR. So the 320 doesn't? No. So really, the only plus point on the Sony is native 4K? Yes. And like I'm saying, I don't think that's going to be as big a deal as people think it is. I think at any sensible viewing distance, on a, not, not a massive screen, but a decent sized screen. A UK sized screen? Yeah. I, I think I think you'd struggle to tell the difference. I mean, um, what you will appreciate then are other factors, maybe the deeper blacks or the uh, the dynamic range or, or, or the did, color. Did, did they say anything? Aspects. Did JVC say anything about the uh, wider color gamut? Because I know it's not something that they've actually dialed into in the past. They, um, I asked that direct question, and they said that both the X seven thousand and the X nine thousand will support DCI, but not the five thousand. Now, was that full gamut DCI or a percentage well, of DCI? No, they said it was full DCI. Hmm, interesting. Obviously, we can test for that when you get it, but... Uh, yeah, well, um, I think I think we're going to have to uh, measure that one. You know, if it can do that, if it can deliver... I mean, that's what I'm saying. I think if the 7000 can deliver, for that price point, can deliver ne increased resolution, if not full native 4K, HDR 10-bit and DCI color space with a full fat bandwidth HDMI 2.0A and HTCP 2.2, um, I think that's a hell of a projector. Hang on, I think I, th I think we got the model numbers wrong, didn't we? Because we were putting the five thousand against the three twenty, and it's not. It's no, a 7, I, I, said, I said seven thousand price point is against the three twenty. Yeah, just yeah. I, I, I think I, I said the wrong model number. Just yeah. in case I confuse people, there, people don't be confused. <laughs> we meant the seven thousand against the three twenty. The five thousand, I have to say, is offering exceptional value. The price point they've got that one. At. <laughs> you're not getting DCI, maybe, but you're getting a lot of other stuff just as well. Um, HDR and, and e shift and, and the blacks and the, an increased brightness. I know that the contrast ratio on these on the five thousand is is less than the previous generation, which is unusual. 
partly, partly because of the increased brightness. But I think uh, I think although people might be disappointed that JVC haven't launched a native 4K projector, I think that's actually not that important. I think there's still a solid, yeah. strong lineup. I, th- I think we said this not last year because there wasn't a JVC projector last year, but um, certainly the year before when we tested JVCs and the Sony's had just come out native 4K and there was a lot of talk about this. I still held the JVCs up, even though they were not native 4K. There was just more to them in terms of image quality. But I guess it's it's what you're after and what you're looking for out of a projector. But I, I still think that holds true. Although I haven't seen the JVCs going on what you said, it sounds very much like they've added a bit of brightness to them and they're still offering the usual um, plus points in the image. Absolutely. Like I said, the X9000, the um, demo sequence and gravity, which was just straight from a Blu-ray, it was in a pitch black room that they built um, on their stand and it was a big screen. And I thought that looked absolutely gorgeous. Really impressive. So, I mean, even if you're just watching uh, Blu-ray, I think it'll still look fantastic. So, mm. and let's be honest, you're going to have a big collection of Blu-rays and hopefully... Well, you are. Some some Ultra HD DVDs, but normally not that many. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, I think it makes an, uh, a really good stopgap projector until we get to... Because well, I think what we're waiting for, ultimately, and I'm not the only person that thinks this, I'm sure, it, it is, you know, fully specced. Uh, 4K, native 4K, DCI, 10 bit, HDR, laser projectors. That's that's the, that's the sort of end yeah, game. Yeah. I mean, you could give me all that in a 1080 model and I'd be happy. Yeah, you know, drop the, drop the but 4K. that's the kind of end game. And, uh, and so this would make a, a very good stopgap for three or four years until we get to that point. Yep, cool. Okay, enough on projectors. Let's move it back to TVs for uh, a little while. And let's go normal TVs to start with, Steve. So the newcomer to the market is Hisense. They have finally made it to Europe. Um, they have had some penetration into the US. We've seen them for a number of years now at CES. They took over the old um, Microsoft stand, the massive Microsoft stand at CES show. Was that three years ago now that they've been yeah, doing that? Yeah, so was, yeah. um, so they, they've managed to move into that market. It's now Europe's turn um, to see Hisense. So what did they have on show? They had a number of TVs on show, but they had their... Um K321, which is their sort of entry-level uh, Ultra HD 4K TV. It's uh, got HDMI 2.0. It's got um, a full array backlight, so that's quite impressive. Um, it ranges from screen sizes 40 to 50 to 55 inch, uh, inches. And the 55 inch is going to be priced at 649 which is spectacularly cheap for a, an Ultra HD 4K TV. It includes HEV, H, HEVC decoding. You know, they're aggressively targeting the marketplace. Uh, so much so that um, at a, a, a sort of closed door demo with um, Samsung, they were actually talking about. Um, ch- they weren't naming any names, but they were talking about Chinese. Well, they didn't even say Chinese. So they were talking about cheaper models, and the fact that they were using RGBW rather than RGB panels, and then they weren't full four K and this kind of stuff. I mean, clearly, it's got them worried that they're seeing quite competitively priced and quite good TVs coming out of other sources. Um, they also had their K seven hundred which um, is, comes 58 and 65-inch screen sizes. That's edge-lit. That should be hitting the shops in the UK before Christmas. There was also the K720, which was a curved screen. Um, interestingly, I said, oh, is, is that um, from Samsung? They said, no, 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 we make all our own panels. So the Hansons actually make their own panels. Not, they're not shipping them in from other third parties. And then they also had their what they call their ULED, <laughs> um, which is kind of their sort of dig, I think, at um, sh- um, Samsung's SUHD. Yeah, but that was um, that was near the best dig. We'll come on to that in a minute. <laughs> and that's the XT910. That comes in 65 and 55 inch screen sizes. Uh, and that's going to be hitting stops in October. And that's got Quantum Dot. It's got HDR. I mean, it's got everything you'd expect to see from a, from a flagship TV. Uh, and that's Hisense. So, you know, yes, they're new to the market. Yes, they're probably not that familiar with a lot of people. But um, I think they're going to be coming in with some pretty decent tellies. And certainly they're going to be coming in with some very aggressive pricing. Hmm. Uh, you meant shops, not stops. I'm, I'm assuming. Stops. Yeah, you said stops, but I'm yeah, assuming stops. that that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. UK stores. Because <laughs> you were go- you were going to talk about dots in the next line, so I'm just assuming that you got ahead of yourself. Uh, yeah, high sense. Um, don't write them off. Don't write them off as as cheap rubbish either, because I think quality wise, they're absolutely. You know, I don't think you could tell between their TV and the two Korean manufacturers in terms of quality. Uh, f- certainly from what, what we've seen in the past and also what you've seen at the show. Um, so don't write them off. Just remember where Samsung and LG were 10 years ago. Yeah, and, that, uh, I mean, they were still building the stand when I was there on Thursday, but uh, they were showing stuff on the TVs and, and it looked great. I mean, I, I couldn't knock it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 
I suspect in 10 years' time, we should be having a very different conversation about Hisense than the yeah. one we are right now. So you mentioned SUHD. Um, yes. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to the LG OLED in a little while, but LG on the stand had Super UHD. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, it's always nice seeing the two and fro in between Samsung and, and LG. You know, if, if one does one thing, then the other has to copy it. And it's that that got a chuckle out of me when I saw that. I just thought, yeah, very good. I did notice that LG are also launching some curved soundbars as well. So yep. not to be. <laughs> <laughs> Get over it, boys. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, before we go to OLED, um, let's go to a TV that turns your living room into a nightclub. Uh, and that's Philips <laughs> with their Ambilight. Now, let me just say this, Ambilight, great invention if it's a solid white light, round about D65, behind the TV, um, we call it bias lighting, they call it Ambilight. Um, it will do that. There, there is a mode in these TVs that, that will let you do that. Mm -hmm. That's what yep. you do That's what you do with Ambilight and then leave it alone. And that should help your eyes, certainly in a dimmer room, um, and give you more comfortable viewing experience where you won't feel tired. Um, viewing it in, in that lighting condition. That's what Ambilight should be used for. However. However. <laughs> <laughs> That's not all it can be used for. Uh, what they've done is, the, uh, I'm not sure the exact number, Steve, is it eight or nine little Pico like projectors? Nine, nine Pico projectors. Pico yeah. projectors, in out of focus projectors, by the way. You know, They're not focused, they're out of focus. Um, and they shine round about the TV, and basically it shows the same image that's on the TV, but blurred round about the outside. Yes. Like say, it needs to be fitted about 20 centimetres from the wall. It will come with a dedicated stand to let you do that. But essentially, it's like watching TV with an out-of-focus projector projecting behind it. Um, yeah. well, that's exactly what it is, in fact. Yep. Um, now, <laughs> I think the silence Philips after that point just says everything. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and there was a bit of a, caused a bit of a stir at the show. It's not my cup of tea. I, I wouldn't, but then, you know, there are people that love putting on Ambilight when it's changing colours and everything and they think it looks great. So I guess for people like that, this would probably be quite good fun. It's not my cup of tea. I, I wouldn't use it personally. I, I, I think it's, um, well, it's, to be honest, a bit gimmicky. But um, like you said, Phil, there's, there, are, there are aspects of Ambilight that are very useful, but um, this is not one of them, unfortunately, in my opinion. Um, not my cup of tea at all. Having said that, their flagship TV, the 9600, looks bloody good. Yeah, we saw uh, that. We saw a sneak peek of that TS, didn't we, with the fireworks display and yeah, and the backlight, the the fold backlight. Um, how many zones is it? Two hundred and fifty-six, something like that. Fifty-six zones, sixteen by sixteen. Yeah, um, I, I and, mean it's really, really. It, think about a firework going off on a pitch black background, and um, certainly going on what we saw on the stand, but also what we saw at, at sneak peek at CES. Really impressive. Yeah, there were shots where the light fireworks will explode and there's obviously light coming from the fireworks that lights up streaks of smoke that you can't see when it's black, but then suddenly light up. I mean, really quite difficult things for... Um, I mean, they were using difficult material for local dimming to deal with and it looked absolutely stunning. If anything, I think it's better than when we saw it, Phil. I literally looked at my... I had my notes from back in January in my same little notebook and it said, like, really impressive, no haloing, etc. And I showed Danny Tack. <laughs> That's even better than when we saw it in January. It looked superb. So it's... Um, it's got um, maximum screen brightness of 600 nits, but it can do 1,000 nits um, peak, what, peak brightness. It supports HDR, 10 bit, 94% uh, of DCI. Now, hang on, let's qualify that because this is where people get confused and, and where the market's confusing people. It's 1,000 nits, but it's not across a uniform screen. No, no. It is no. a small portion of the screen. I think it's something like 20 or 30%. Uh, it can do 30% of the screen. 30%, there you go. But obviously what you do is you wouldn't even do that much. What you really want to do is you want to pick out highlights within the image. Yes. that you want to be particularly bright. So maybe it's a, the sun or a light glinting off armour or something like that. That's what this is about. It's not about having a thousand nits of full brightness. That would just be awful. It's about making little things stand out more. Uh, and, and like we said earlier, widening the dynamic range between peak whites and deep blacks. So, so does that mean if I video you and we put you on an HD, HDR screen, the little highlights, i.e. you, appear more prominent? Well, you'll be able to see more detail, detail in my head when the light, the shines. light shining <laughs> off his head will be just perfect. Yeah, we can we can see the age lines, freckles and hairs get, get lost <laughs> in, in, in in standard definition, isn't it? In standard, in standard dynamic range. Yeah, you know this this is where everybody's getting confused. Uh, the, you know, ninety percent of the, the the consumer market they don't even know what four K is yet. So you throw HDR at them, 
and then you start talking about big brightness numbers they automatically expect these TVs to be mega bright and that is not the point of HDR I've seen some posts from people who went around um, IFA on the forums as well where they haven't been impressed because they were expecting the brightness and the brightness isn't there well it's not it's not supposed to be yeah. it's the layers it's the latitude of the image between black and white yeah and what they should be looking for is details within bright parts of the image which just aren't there in standard and dynamic range like um things like uh on a, uh, there's the moon in in the life of pi demo you can see all this detail in the moon you just can't see or you mentioned this the sun at the beginning of sunshine the demo that you saw in um in fireworks in a scene from um the great gatsby you can just see all this detail in people as they get lit up by the fireworks and then the details in the fireworks themselves they just aren't there in standard dynamic range it isn't you just can't do it this isn't isn't the range there to deliver that kind of detail but there is with hdr and that's why we're talking about earlier about better pixels not just more pixels you know yes you've got the increased resolution but you've got wider dynamic range more colors to play with more bit depth so there's no banding that's going to give you a really really good looking picture yeah the, um, the other the other confusing thing is um there is no such thing as an hdr camera people Everything that's ever been made on 35 mil or even shot digitally, there's certain bits of information because uh, nowadays everything goes into basically a digital base. So even 35 millimeter film is scanned digitally and, and worked on. So there's bits and pieces that are thrown away. And then when the, the, the colorist used to work on the film, they were working on pretty dim displays. So again, there was more detail was being thrown away because they couldn't get it down the pipeline and so on. I hate it, it when I can't get it down the pipe. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to the uh, the guy I was talking to from um, Hanno Hanno Bassa. Uh, he uh, he's technical um, chief technical technology officer at at, at um, 20th Century Fox, also president of the Ultra HD Alliance. And uh, he was talking about how frustrating it's been all these years because I mean up until now the standard's been as we mentioned in previous podcasts. You know they've been using Rec 709 and 100 nit uh, monitors for, for for doing their um transfers and they said it's been so frustrating because they lose so much between yeah, what yeah. you see at the cinema and what they can deliver at home because of the limitations of the technology at the but, time but, but, said, this not, is going to all completely change now yeah and, and it's not just the cinema to the home that there was stuff on film that couldn't even make it to the cinema because they didn't mm. have ways of, of color timing and so on um so yeah you can expect to be buying all your favorite films <laughs> even oh, from god <laughs> All the way back in in time again in HDR, and you will. This is we're not talking. This is why HDR is bigger, I think, than 4K resolution. You will see things that you have never seen before in highlights and in in the dark areas and and in the image because there'll be so much information that can now come down the pipeline from film or from a digital capture nowadays um, to the home. And what you see in the home will be what you see in the cinema. And like Ron Martin pointed out in, in the interview, if you haven't seen it, it's on the home page. It's more controlled at home as well. You know, you're not looking at a 30 foot screen that's having light bouncing off it two or three times and, you know, uh, degrading the image. You see it at home, it's in a controlled environment, hopefully. You see even more detail. It's interesting that um, something that hadn't occurred to me, but which Hanno Bassa mentioned, was that uh, when they first started doing these HDR transfers, they were concerned not about um, the, the photographed image. I said we'd had no, no no issues with that. We we knew it was going to look good. We were concerned whether the special effects were going to transfer across any visual effects. I mean, in the film, were going to have enough impact, or whether we're going to have to start redoing them again. Yeah. I said, luckily, he said, it was certainly in the stuff that we've transferred, um, like, like Life of Pi, for example. He said that we were really relieved to see that those effects still retained their impact and range in HDR and didn't get washed out or lose yeah, detail. Yeah, because I mean, if you think about it, you know, the old optical effects that they used to do that was just film upon film upon film upon film <laughs> <laughs> yeah that might be trickier but at least certainly with modern effects you know, i think they, they, it's, it appears that they stand up quite well yeah um which is good news because obviously if you had to do redo effects that would add to the cost and delay things and, and probably they wouldn't get released i suppose yeah but um anyway nine six hundred um the really good news not only that is it a great looking tv from what i saw at the show but the really good news this time around is it's actually going to get released in the uk for a change um, had that on video from the managing director of Philips, uh, Graham Speak. He said, we will be getting it before Christmas in the UK. So, Graham, I'm holding you to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, it has been a problem from over the last few years actually getting their product into UK stores, but they are yeah. now John Lewis, Curry's, everybody has Philips stock in now. So um, you should be able to find these. You should be able to demo them. The 9600, really impressive TV. And hopefully we'll be getting that in for review soon. And it's the 8600 that has the projectors, isn't it? 
No, that's the 8900. The 8900. 8600 is just the sort of the one step below. It doesn't have HDR, but otherwise it's pretty similar to the 9600. It doesn't have uh, direct backlight or all the dimming zones either. Okay. Uh, and then there's the... Um, there's, yeah, that, those are the main ones. And then there's the 6000 series. And, and I don't think the 7000 series or the curved TV will be coming to the UK, though, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and uh, the the one thing about the 8600 was the, the screen, the um, speakers that were attached to the screen. Ah, yes, that was it. You that could take them off. So Sony... these are tiny, tiny ones. The yeah, yeah. Thin ones, yeah. Yeah. yeah but Actually, do you know what? I was, I was surprised. I was, you know, grudgingly impressed by those. They do look um, nice. Yeah, but also, no, not uh, appearance is, is in speakers is, is nothing. The uglier the speaker, the probably the better it works. But um, I I actually thought what was coming out of them was in it. What in Efa is always a very challenging environment for that. I thought that sounded <coughs> perfectly acceptable, certainly yeah. for just normal viewing. Yeah, no, I, I, really impressive. And I was just going to say, Sony take note. Yeah, so I don't know why someone else hasn't done that before. It's such an obvious idea, isn't it, to detach the speaker so you get more stereo width. And also, um, you know, if you, if you don't necessarily want to use the speakers, you can make your TV a little bit narrower. And, and yeah. as you say, Phil, Sony could probably learn a lesson from yeah. that. Yeah, well, I mean, Pi- <laughs> Pioneer used to do that with the Kura. You could either yeah. buy them on the sides or you could buy the, the long speaker bar that went underneath and you had a choice of what you wanted to do. So, um, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to see that coming back because, like you say, it gives people choice. It gives people better sound as well. And on that, Philips, I didn't actually hear it in action, Ed, so I can't talk about the, the sound side of things, but um, it certainly looked nice. Um, it, honestly, sonically, I, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, based on low aspirations for what these screens normally sound like, given how impossibly teeny those speakers were, I was I was yeah, quite impressed. Excellent. So let's get on to the big subject of IFA, and that's audio. <laughs> mm-hmm. Play nice. <laughs> Sorry, Ed, I couldn't resist it. Let's talk OLED, and then we're going to go to audio. So um, OLED, um, usually... Exclusively LG's, um, not this time around. I had been dying for a long time to tell you about this TV because we saw it back in June. Unfortunately, we had to sign an NDA that said, you will not talk about this until such and such a time. Under pain of death. Uh, yeah, so there was a big fine attached if you actually yeah, broke the NDA. But um, yeah, we saw this uh, back in June and then again at the show. And um, Panasonic have basically taken... LG's uh, panel, that's where they're getting it from, there's no secret about that and then they've added their secret sauce to it, their processing, their 4K Studio Master processing and um, sorted some of the issues that were highlighted on the the LG like uh, vignetting and um, coming out of black and I have to say um, the LG OLEDs look fantastic the Panasonic, I don't know what what their secret sauce is because the plasmas always had beautiful looking colours and, and depth and detail and again the, the OLED just looked stunning yeah it did it did look bloody good I, I think they've almost it's, I mean we always talk about it and this thing as a perfect TV and blah 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 and a consumer television etc but it looks like Panasonic have rather have pulled out all the stops as far as this TV goes they've decided to make possibly the best TV they possibly can which, which is with quite current worrying. technology right yeah which is quite worrying <laughs> Because it could go one or two ways now. But yeah, I mean, the pull at this stops. There's no such thing as a perfect TV, so let's just get that out of the way. There will be <laughs> issues with this, with this Panasonic. No doubt about yes. it. People will pick up on things that they don't like. A lot of it's usually source material that, that interacts a certain way with the technology and makes it look... But there, there were some issues with the, the OLED panel. I mean, um, LG uh, wouldn't admit to it, but Panasonic certainly said what the issues were and what they've done to fix it. And I think more or less they, they, they said that so they could push the fact that, you know, this is their secret sauce that, that's making it look as good as it is and getting away from the dark edges and, and making the uniformity absolutely bang on. They couldn't push it too far. So they did have a, a side-by-side demonstration with uh, the VT Plasma. The VT Plasma, in terms of uniformity, was more uniform than the OLED. But the reason for that was that they were having to drive the edges of the OLED with the picture processing to make it uniform and if they pushed it too far it was going to introduce artifacts and, and all the rest and we spoke to the engineers at quite some length didn't we Steve about yeah. um, what they were actually doing with the processing and it's, it's all really interesting stuff and 
I guess the, the main thing is this is a premium product. They're not shying away from the fact it's a premium product. It has Alcantara on the back. <laughs> that's high-end auto stuff, usually. And it's a premium got, premium product that's going to come with an equally premium price. Exactly, and there's, and there's no getting away from that because when you see the technology in action, you know, that's not coming cheap. I mean, they're, they're engineers, and you're talking about the engineers that have got come from Pioneer to Panasonic to work on the plasmas and now working on this, which is, is exciting in itself. And one of the guys that did the presentation... Um, on the Panasonic stand um, was the old Pioneer head engineer um, who went through what they'd been working on in terms of, you know, black levels coming out of black. Now, this is the main thing. This is the thing that kept, keeps getting misunderstood, Steve. And what we mean about coming out of black is you have black, which is pitch black. And then just above it, you start to see a little bit of detail. And then just above that, you start to see a little bit more detail. And we're talking like 5% above yeah. black. And then 10% above black, and then 15% above black. And then when you compare that to what the other OLED panels are doing, when they come out of black, they're not coming out of black until they hit about 20%. So you're losing that little bit of detail. And that's where Panasonic have nailed it coming out of black. It just looks more realistic. More There's more depth to the image. It's just And it's, it's just that one little thing. But once you get it right, and, and it was one of the big plus points of Plasma as well, was, was that coming out of black and it just adds so much more to the image yeah if, if you were to uh if you were to buy a not a recommended if you were to buy a, a studio monitor oled screen that they use in in studios and they um they had um they, we've both seen them being used for demonstration purposes and comparison purposes there was one actually if wasn't there but next to um their tv in a darkened room those things are about what 30 grand or at least <laughs> little, little, um, little yeah. 15 inch yeah <laughs> Um, what is it? Is it 15 inch? Yeah, 15 yep, inch um, yep. OLED. So that's, that's how much a professional studio grade OLED monitor will cost you. What Panasonic are trying to deliver, oh, and I, so you might think it's expensive, but what they're trying to deliver is that level of quality in a consumer television set, basically. Looking at what, based upon the demonstrations we've seen, obviously we haven't tested it yet, but based upon demonstrations we've seen, you know, I, I don't think they might have achieved it. Um, so that kind of ambition is never going to come cheap, but, but um, the results speak for themselves. It looks superb. It'd be interesting to see how LG respond to this. Well, well we've, seems... we've seen that today, haven't we? They're going to yes. sell an OLED every minute. Mm -hmm. Now, can I from just interject as a normal human being with very limited video training and the fact that I wear glasses and all the rest of it? Now, I'm the first to acknowledge that obviously all the stuff that's demonstrated at the shows, as distinct from the demonstration that you guys have, is not intrinsically taxing. Um, no, it they would be are chosen to make their TV look as good Precisely as that. The big problem for me, I'm, you know, keen enough that there's, no, I don't, you know, I'm not interested in having anything other than a good screen, but it's the difference. To, here we hover between the difference between good and great. And based on the admittedly very relaxed nature of demonstration work that was going on at IFA, money no object, the Panasonic is, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. If the talk about the sort of list pricing is 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 halfway accurate, unfortunately, in my less critical existence, it doesn't justify the extra cost over the OG. Well, units. but you see, if I was to say the same about a turntable, Ed, you would <laughs> you would be like, oh no 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 no, it is worth well, it because that, because you're getting enough. this this However, performance level at this price point, and and this is what we're saying, you are paying for the performance. At, at, at this price point, not everybody's going to pay for it. Is it worth it? Well, it depends on on what, you, what how you value stuff and and what There's you one value extra stuff at. So. For this, um, which is, is not a, normally applicable in my, my my side of things, we're still dealing with a technology which is relatively young. My concern for Panasonic is that simple production level innovation and development is going to render the advantages that this screen has comparatively short-lived. This in comparison, let's not use turntables as they're, but they're, they are decidedly weird because they, they're, the technology finished being developed decades ago. But say, for example, a pair of loudspeakers or something like that, the length of time for which it has a clear-cut advantage is decidedly unclear. Yes, and this is why... I said right at the beginning when we started talking about the Panasonic OLED, it might be a bad thing because this could be Panasonic saying, look, this is an OLED, this is what we can do with it, um, this is you know the outstanding picture that you get from it. By the way, we can't afford to make it anymore and we can't afford to be in the TV market and they could power out on a high. 
we saw it with plasma. That's what they did. They, they brought out the VT series, and then called it a day. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. You're saying this is their swan song. I, I, I'm not saying that, but <laughs> no. But again, Steve, I will say it, it would be. A, it seems abundantly clear that the whole pricing on this is there's no scope for buying market share in this one. I think a number of manufacturers have tried this to death, and it's you simply end no, up no, selling no, a lot of tellies and making there, no there money is, on any of them. There is no way that that they are um, going for volume sales on this. There's so no way that, that, that they are pushing this. Has to presumably generate something approaching an operating profit in its I, own right. I, I think if you look at the dealers who will be able to sell this, it's going to be very much like the old VT was, where it was selected dealers who could demonstrate it in certain ways, um, and basically who who could afford to have it on in in their stock. Um, and they're going to sell very small numbers. Of I think um, they're not. They're, they don't want to sell large numbers because no, I they suspect don't. they haven't got very many of them. Exactly. Um, exactly. Are they not? They're not selling it in the states, are they, Phil? No, it's not for sale in the states. So it's just so, Japan so is, and Europe. This is just Japan and Europe for this TV. Um, they said they will say more at CES, but that's more for the US market. In terms of Europe and Japan, we we're getting this TV, but we're getting it in so such small numbers, and the amount, of, like I say, the dealers who will be able to sell them are quite small as well, like they were with the ZT. I certainly think you know Panasonic. They kind of have one hand tied behind the back because they have to take the the panels from LG Display at the moment, um, and until there's more manufacturers of these. Uh, panels, then that's the way it's going to be. Uh, the main exercise for Panasonic, and if people haven't taken taken away the message yet, then uh, they never will. Is that they're basically showing off what they can do with the technology mm. and and the their electronics, their software, their driving of the panels of the picture, their experience coming from plasma, which is a similar type of uh, you know self emitting technology. So they're used to working in that realm. And this is a showcase product for them. This is what they can do, and they're showing us what, what they can do with it. If it's too rich for you, their LED LCD TVs this year are very strong as well. Um, in fact, in, in the lower section of the market, the CX I'm reviewing at the moment, I don't want to give it back because it's such a great little TV. And you're talking 700 quid for something mm -hmm. like that. So the prices are coming down there. Their LED TVs are really good. So, so this, you know, this is never going to be a mass market thing. It's aimed at the, the rich enthusiast, the type of um, early adopter who doesn't mind going out and spending close on eight grand on a TV. There's very few of them. So I understand it. It doesn't even include the Firefox OS, does it? Because no. every single bit of processing power yep. is, is aimed at the picture. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's, that's what... Um, the engineer was saying, yeah, it's, um, it, it wouldn't have Firefox or uh, any of the, the, uh, the major smart stuff in there. It is just mm. for picture quality. As far as LG go, it was a bit disappointing at their stand because they, even though they had announced um, a new range of flat oh, OLED screens, you, you know what? it wouldn't actually identify in them, would they? You, you know what? That, that, that dark area of the stand, all you could see was journalists wandering around with confused <laughs> looks on their faces saying, Where's the, where's the new OLED TVs? And you're like, well, this is them, but they're not telling us which ones is which. You can kind of work it out because some are yeah. flat and some are curved, some, but yeah. they wouldn't tell you which TVs were which. The the demonstrations were strange. I mean, the the BBC HDR stuff looked fantastic, and then right next to it, they were showing um, A Million Ways to Die in the West in HDR. It was obviously coming off a PC, which was really struggling to play it because there was banding and gradation errors. Now, you see, they'd knocked that on the head by the time I got there. Oh, well, obviously, the command had come down from on high, cease and desist, and they'd ceased and desisted. So, um, and and yeah. I, don't, I don't blame them because it made no. it look really no, bad. I, I saw yeah. the BBC HDR footage. I have to say, as someone who prefers his televisions to be flat, that flat OLED looked marvellous. I would be quite content to find yeah, that. Yeah, I, I thought with the with the BBC HDR material, again, you know, it's material that makes the screens look good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're not going to show anything that you're familiar with. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you. Uh, the flat TVs look nice. But I've got to say, with LG, the curve, it's it's not over-pronounced, is it, Steve? No, no, I completely no. agree with you. But now it's going to have to go up on a wall. Even then, I, I just would... I, I'm having seen some curved sets wall mounted. It's not quite as odd as I thought it might be, but I'd still rather it were flat, especially yeah. as it's not a particularly large room for me, and someone has to be sort of off axis. So yeah. flat. I mean, unfo unfortunately, with the material, we couldn't get in to see if it was still vignetted with the flat panel. But I, I'm going to stick my neck out and say that that it should be easier uniformity wise. 
<laughs> um, I mean, you, you've got to imagine uh, with, with a flat screen, it should make, the, you know, just thinking logically, it should should make it easier to, to get a unit. Yeah, well, I was looking for it, and, and obviously the material wasn't necessarily lending itself to that particular effect, but um, I was struggling to see any, any really, and except by the very edge. Um, but certainly nothing like as bad as I've seen, I've seen on some of the models. So. I, I guess the, the good point here is that these are down, certainly penciled in for October, uh, to be released to the market and the Panasonic was the end of October beginning of November so they should be hitting the market round about the same time and, and obviously we're going to be nagging uh, the respective people mm -hmm. at LG and uh, Panasonic until they relent and, and give us um, them in for review and as soon as we can get them in for review um, you can bet your bottom dollar that we'll have them in and uh, test them and yeah it, it, apart from the, the UHD Blu-ray side of things um, IFA, even though I was only there for a day and a half, had everything that I thought I was going to have, and and really pushing the the technology that little bit further. And for me, the emphasis on picture quality is always a winner. Yeah, definitely. I mean, unless everyone sort of thinks we're having a bit of a go at, at LG, I have to say that um, any issues aside, I still think their OLEDs look fantastic. And there's been a lot of demonstrations at other manufacturer sites where they've got their LED TVs and they've been saying, look, you know, we can deliver picture quality as good as or even not better than OLED and they've had a, an <laughs> LG OLED next door and every single time I think I'd rather have the OLED. <laughs> Never yeah, once yeah. I've oh, oh, yeah, demos oh, yeah. where I've thought, well, yeah. Yeah, I want the LED TV. <laughs> yeah, I really don't want people getting the wrong idea here. The, LE, the LG OLEDs, really, really good. Really, really good. Um, it was just the way the stand was set out. I, you know, if it was me that was in charge, I would have done it so much better than than they did because i think the assumption was there that we'd know what the tvs were and and nobody had a clue but it was quite funny seeing all these journalists wandering around saying do you know which tvs which <laughs> and almost exactly an hour <laughs> <laughs> and ed <laughs> i've got a minute have i <laughs> <laughs> uh no. yeah okay ed i mean we have been talking about uh, you're saying an hour it'll be a bit shorter by the yeah, time that people listen to it but, but yes we'll get round to um yeah your part of it which was um everything else basically <laughs> well we didn't have time but you know only yeah. had a day and a half so no well i only had two but you know yeah but yeah that. yeah it's not it's not like the hi-fi world moves on in, in huge leaps and bounds every year though is it so. well it's funny you should i don't know whether this is a, a, a an entity segue on your part but yes there is a there is a final irony that within 20 feet of the oleds um on the panasonic stand was uh them demonstrating or not demonstrating just a teaser to the next big release in the technics the re reinvigorated technics line having denied six ways from sunday that they were going anywhere near it uh there was a record player or at least mm -hmm. parts of a record many people are very very affectionate i think including our own phil hinton about the sl 1210 1200 semi pro turntable and please be under no illusions it's a mighty mighty piece of kit but it had a big brother, um, which was really for professional and then home use. It was never used for DJing because it essentially only has two speeds. It was called the SP10, and it was made from the very early 70s till about 1988. And there's a number of people who can make you a very cogent argument that they are. it is the best, one of the finest turntables ever made. And they had the, pro the motor from the original 70s prototype of the SP10, and entirely unaccident, non-accidentally next to it, there was this new prototype. And there were some people suggesting that this this prototype is going to be model uh, have a model number in the in the twelve hundred series, which I think would be the dumbest thing they've ever done. This was son of SP ten, um, and uh, you know a completely bespoke direct drive high end turntable from a major Japanese manufacturer. If you told me that three or four years ago, <laughs> I'd, have, I'd have assumed that you'd, you'd had a really good afternoon in the pub. But it was there. You could all see it. And the thing is about IFA is that fundamentally IFA is not a hi-fi show. As we know, it's a trade show. It's an unsympathetic trade show. It's manufacturers bringing stuff there, which is setting their commercial stall out for the next six, six to 12 months. And... Part and not only with Panasonic, with a number of other organisations as well, two channel and vinyl and all the rest of it is back in their in their sort of 
core business it is how they anticipate reaching the customer and 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 getting business and i just think that's very cool after you know being being on the uh, being on the endangered species list it it's back and before i talk about it, talk, ignoring necessary specific products there's just a sense that as Phil's alluded to with with many aspects, there is an element the industry's got its mojo back. And also, after a couple of false starts and experiments and all the rest of it, they have built, they're, they're building stuff that the, the the public want that takes advantage of equipment they already have and is just clever, brilliant, and capable of great performance. And I'd seen some signs of it a little bit at Bristol quite a bit more at Munich and yeah it's just it's building now it's at sensible money and it's all very exciting stuff so yeah it's it's, it's very positive so Ed let's talk turntables all right <laughs> we kind of hinted at it when it was it was this time last year that Technics came back yes and we discussed whether or not they would uh, look at bringing a turntable oh, back they absolutely denied it and they were still denying it at Munich yeah um so what did they announce at IFA? The fact that the turntable's coming back. And interestingly, they're going to base it on the SP and not the SL. Well, it looks... this is it, The design design basis is much more SP, to, to my to my eyes anyway. Um, but, you know, it's hard... So there were people... There were uh, Now, you see, the thing about people wearing Panasonic shirts at IFA is that some of them are Panasonic employees... Others are from agencies. They've been brought in, and they're just reciting stuff. So there's you. You could get different answers from different people about how much it's supposed to cost and what it's what it's called. But there were some people insinuating it's an SL, um, but it it looks like an SP. Uh, no, it, it's it's definitely SP because um I, and forgive me, I have forgotten the head of Technics's name. Um, but at the press conference she did specifically said they were basing it on the SP model. And they were going for sound quality, and that to me said expensive. And looking at the yeah. prototype, it looks like one piece of metal, direct drive. Well, now you see, I don't think we can draw too much about the base. I think that that plinth thing might have been a means to an end of getting it to sit there and to not give too much away about what's on the inside. Maybe. Um, no one would be prepared to be drawn as to whether it would be like the old SP models, which were just a turntable in a square block and which you then assembled into your own plinth but you see that's that's what i was assuming ed um just just by the design and what was said at the press conference and um and the fact that they are completely reworking the direct drive that to yeah. me says that they're heading for sound quality that's that's oh god yeah no it. no question about that but i i just it it's still as you know there's two very distinct lines of these new technic products one of which is unbelievably expensive and one of which is you know, entry level, high end, and it's not a, immediately clear which which one this is. So, yeah, we shall see. But do you know what's interesting is it wasn't the only direct drive turntable that broke cover at the show. Because um, if it's all sounding a bit expensive to you, Audio Technica, the uh, headphones, microphones, cartridges, accessories people, they've been making a small number of record players for some years, and they've just gone and launched a completely new home oriented direct drive turntable and it will be uh comes with its own arm again modeled on an all old audio technica design uh, a, a hot rodded version of one of their cartridges and it's got a switchable phono stage on the back and it's going to be yours for i think a whisker under 400 pounds for a, a proper bespoke direct drive turntable i'm thinking mr hinton that if we do get one of those in for review it probably needs to be looked at by you as the leading advocate of the direct drive principle um, Other no. than the fact you don't have any records, but we can talk that out. <laughs> but Ed, if we're going back into my direct drive days, then I'd need two of them and a mixer. Well, unfortunately, they have two speeds, 33 and 45, no pitch control, so you'd have to be <laughs> kind of calm about what you did in mixing terms, Phil. It wasn't just, and I need to stress, it wasn't just turntables. There were <laughs> millions of Bluetooth speakers. Uh, there is now a Bluetooth speaker of any shape, size, and design to suit any taste. Um, I would say... That another company that has come back in from the cold and is suddenly designing stuff which is really rather lovely again is a company I've also never previously seen at IFA, which was Bang & Olufsen. They had a stand, and I don't imagine for a second that the stuff that was on it is going to be bargain in, in cost terms, but it was 
lovely. It was everything you wanted a Bang & Olufsen product to be. It's funny you say that because I, I really noticed it on the bus trip into IFA every morning and, and travelling backwards and forwards. The number of shops um, in Berlin who had Bang & Olufsen stuff in the windows. Yeah. And they really are, they've paid, they, they, no, that was a company that was flirting on the edge of extinction a couple of years ago. And the stuff that's back there, it, it was cool and it was what it should be. And that, that was really cool. And um, also, uh, I did say it wasn't going to talk too much about headphones and earphones. Um, as you know, oh, oh, those of you who've read reviews and so on and so forth, I have been of the absolutely fixed opinion that in terms of all roundability the best earphone in the world is sennheiser's um ie 800 uh 600 pounds which is a huge amount of money but it is when you need it to be amazing it's amazing when you just need to blank out someone talking bollocks to you it's as convenient <laughs> as a 30 pound like listen earphone. to this podcast then <laughs> yeah well whatever um good news is that um Finally, it's got some competition, and it's from another German manufacturer, obviously. Uh, Bayer Dynamic. Uh, their high-end headphones use what they call Tesla drivers. Uh, thankfully, that's not because they shoot bolts of electri- electricity into the side of your head. Although that would be quite cool. Well, for the people watching it, not necessarily for the user. Um, they're called that because they generate a, a unit of measurement of a Tesla's worth of energy through a, an aperture in the driver. Um, and they've given their factory employees just the right amount of caffeine, and they are now able to hand-wind a Tesla-style driver for an earphone. And they've now got a new earphone out with these drivers in. Uh, I'm not going to lie, it's 990 euros. So it's going to work out about 800, 850 quid, maybe even a little bit higher, depending on how, how poorly our currency is doing at the time. And um, the thing is, I'm a total convert. I will perform any act, no matter how sordid, to have an, a proper listen to those with equipment with which I am more familiar and like the Sennheiser, they're small, they're beautifully made, they've got a sensible carry case, they have no bizarre electrical measurements or anything like that. They just look like a perfect real-world solution. And, yeah, genuinely awesome, awesome product. Um, um, one of my highlights, undoubtedly. Obviously, we need to move things along a little bit because yeah. we spent too much time talking about TVs and other things that you're not interested in, Ed. But um, in terms of German manufacturers, did you get to see much of their stuff? I'm thinking like Teufel and so on. Uh, well, Teufel um, hadn't actually got anything particularly new. The one thing that did what came as a bit of a surprise is that their stand backed on to another company, Raumfeld. And I hadn't realised that those two were in some way related, but they clearly appear to be. So... Um, uh, and actually, must be said, it was a bit of a weird one for German manufacturers, full stop. Canton's stand was a giant sort of two-fingered salute to real people because it was literally just a giant dealer area. And the only product was in the dealer area, which you couldn't get in to see, uh, which <laughs> struck me as a bizarre way of yeah, spending a yeah. lot of money at the I, I think I think we need to explain this one quickly to um, the listeners, right? So if you think about... Um, trade shows, you normally have a stand. Well, the way that IFA works is that normally these companies have um, a big stand and then they'll have an information desk and the other side of this information desk behind some curtains is the dealer area and the uh, distributor area, which has all the products that are on the stand shown yet again inside, um, but you get free coffee and drinks and yeah. sandwiches yeah. and stuff like that. But Canton's was only a dealer area. You could walk around the outside and look at some logos, but the only product on display was behind was was being guarded by people. You couldn't see it, which just struck me as a really bizarre way of spending a lot of money at a trade show. But hey, it's not my money. I don't care. Um, as other than uh, Sennheiser had, uh, they've got a new um, closed back, fairly high end headphone for use on the move at home, which looks. Gorgeous, did sound very impressive. Uh, Yamaha uh, are always big attenders at IFA. They don't do the high-end show at Munich. They do IFA instead. Um, very big stand. Lots of the music cast product, Steve and I had already seen it, but IFA was a, a bit of an advantage because it was actually lit in such a way as you yeah, could, we could see it could in daylight. See it. <laughs> um, and the true scope of what they're doing 
really is becoming apparent. I mean, yeah. all of the new AV receivers fitted with it. And I mean, all of them. I mean, so you've got the little baby ones are fitted with yeah, it. Yeah, well, they, I've, I've just gotten the, the bottom, of, bottom of the bottomest AVR and it has it on it. Yeah, and um, by the same token, they've recently just rehashed the processor. So the 5000 series processor, the amp stays the same. The processor has been updated. So it, it's got Atmos and DTSX importantly an hdcp 2.2 but it's still music cast capable and then the other thing and i'm hoping steve managed to get a demo of it as well they were yeah. running the atmos soundbar very very impressive considering I, that was in a glass box and it, a show, in, i on a i am yeah like steve i totally when you think about it it actually makes more sense than i really because of course with atmos speakers that are working on the principle of firing upwards anyway that is obviously a reverb effect so what's going to be better at the reverb effect than an entire system built around the reverb effect anyway but i was taken aback at how effective it genuinely is they it showed me the really maze something. trailer uh, Phil from the demo disc, the Atmos demo disc, which is the one with the the, the jungle and the thunder and everything. Um, and I've heard that dozens and dozens of times on different systems and on my own system and everything. So I'm very familiar with what I'm supposed to be hearing. And that did a bloody good job of replicating that, considering from a it, you know, single was, point source. Yeah, I was <laughs> really really quite impressed. Did you do the um, J747 taking? Yeah, away your head yeah, well? that yeah. was quite something as well. So uh, uh, so yeah, very impressive. Now that's yeah, so that's going to be. Uh, the YSP five six hundred, isn't it? Um, yeah, got a subwoofer, uh, soundbar, and it supports DTSX and Dolby Atmos. So um, that's impressive. So Along we, with a ton of other stuff too. We have asked for the processor. I know I'm getting that mm -hmm. with the power amp, and this soundbar is coming yeah. when? Uh, well, as soon as, as soon as they've got one available, basically. Right. Cool. And then I will be taking a look at MusicCast. Um, uh, I'll be having some proper demonstrations. Of various configurations down at Yamaha HQ, uh, which is six minutes away from my house. But it depends how fast I drive. But very close. Um, <laughs> and then we'll we'll work out something to actually. When they when they told me that when they when they send out some um, uh, AVRs for review, for example, they'll include a um, one a of their packs speaker, of a little yeah. speaker, so you can test out music cast yourself. Um, and they've obviously got in terms of AVRs the, the sort of the big lineup for um, for us. And the three of us did them last year, or early this year in some respects. Mm. Um, will be the one zero, the, the 1050, the 250, and the 350, which yeah. are the kind of prime AVRs with um, Atmos and DTSX. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. Um, before we leave audio, then, uh, we've touched on it with Music Cast. Uh, I saw it everywhere. I saw it on every stand. Everybody's now doing multi room stuff. Um, yes. But apart from Music Cast, the, the one that really kind of impressed me, Steve, was the one that was on the Philips stand. It Was it called Lily? Is he? Izzy, that's it. Izzy. Izzy. <laughs> um, from an end user's point of view, I, I mean, sound quality wise, it's what you would expect out of a little cube box with a driver in it. I mean, it, it was never going to set the world alight. But the simplicity of it, that's what that's what got me. Yeah. Um, and the fact that you don't have to tune it in or find the broadband or anything, it, it, you just switch it on and it works. Yeah, it's one touch um, connection up to, I think it was five or six units. Uh, very simple, very sure. And that, that's kind of the key, really. Um, I like the way that Yamaha have approached it, which is basically to put put it into everything. Um, that makes building up a system almost you would do it by accident, if, if you weren't even intending to. Or the alternative is to make it as as simple as possible. Um, and I think that's what Philip, the approach Philip's have taken, which is to make it something that's really, really simple. Uh, and, and aimed at the kind of the casual user who just wants to be able to go from one room to the next and listen to a bit of music and, and not... You know, it's just going to be simple and easy and and fun, and, and I think they they kind of nailed that. And they did, and they did. And funny though, it was I thought the the actual uh, little film they showed at the press conference kind of actually nailed it in terms of what it was trying to achieve. Yeah, but it's full of hipsters. It was it was full of annoying hipsters. <laughs> if we are talking about Phillips briefly, I don't. Know, did you spot? The th it, I, 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 words are like, I, hard to describe. I'm going to put this in the show report because I found it so extraordinary. Um, there was a device in the corner which they were referring to optimistically as a mini system, but it had a pair of speakers yes, that looked yes, like they'd yes. been stolen off Lee Scratch Perry. <laughs> it's 20 inch space drivers. Yes, I pointed that out to Steve. I said, Look, 3,600 3, watts of power, Steve, and it's gold. And they refused to turn it on for me. I was really disappointed. I mean, I don't take that to be a good sign, but um, it was. It looks awesome. I, 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 you know, 
<laughs> yeah, we, we, uh, it, it was on show at the Gibson tent as well at CES. It was there. Um, and I'm, I, I, if I remember right, it was actually playing stuff there. Um, yeah, there was no, some, some quite good um, lines from Phillips actually at their press conference. Because remember the noise cancelling headphones, Phil, which were <laughs> noise cancelling on demand, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to on or off. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and I, I will say also, um, I, I have to, it's, I possibly counts as a slight backward step. Last, I last went to you for two years ago, not last year, and um, I thought there had actually been a significant. Uh, downturn in the companies just relying on women wearing lycra and cling film to sell stuff, uh, but that appears to have been reversed this time round. It was, I don't know. It's just all a bit naff, for want of a better description. Did you see the thing that was on? Um, it's on the TV last night. It was the the highlights of the seventies or the best the yes, best things yes, about the seventies. I was you still trying to head back from Berlin. So <laughs> it, was yeah. it was it was the thing. I remember the, some of this. Oh yeah, it was uh, it was the guy that was presenting on Pebble Mill where he lit yeah. up a cigarette. He's surrounded by dolly birds at this trade show. It was just fantastic. He it sat above like, them on some sort of recliner, isn't he? Smoking <laughs> fag. Thinking, you just wouldn't get away with that these days. Yeah, no. and, and all he was doing was George blacking up. He couldn't have been much more offensive. <laughs> So yeah, but yeah, Aoife wasn't. It wasn't very progressive. Let's put it like that. Spot um, any uh, Germans in uh, heavy metal t-shirts? I didn't see very many actually. There was a man wearing a Demis Rousseau style caftan, which I thought was a bold fashion choice. I saw a German in a, in a leather onesie, which I thought was a bit. I think Brilliant. it was a deliberate. I think he, I don't think he was being ironic. I think it was a genuine <laughs> sartorial statement on his part. Um, genuine choice, but um, yeah. yeah, that was a bit scary. Big, big, fat, beery, bearded guy. Um, not making any, all, all leathered up in a conclusions one there, but uh, <laughs> and I then I like... know it's only incidental to sort of AV forums interest. It, it crosses over. Um, I thought the the new Sony Z5 Premium phone that looked spectacular. Did you? Um, we, we looked at that and looked at the 4K image and then got our noses right up to it and thought, eh. <laughs> I just thought it looked. I thought I, again from a, a more layperson. I thought it looked lovely. It was a bit of a downer that you, you're only allowed. You know, on the normal days they were being heavily guarded by people, so you didn't get to see very much of it. <laughs> um, and obviously, a slight bias. I make it. I'm a Motorola owner as it stands, but the new Motorola's they've just done the same thing as before. It's still a lovely, clean Android interface. They haven't stuck their crap all over it. Um, and they're just nice phones to hold and use and stuff. I was, I, I, I hope that they're going to continue to do quite well with those because they are nice, nice phones. Okay, um, we've been so on message <laughs> this this week, but then uh, we've had Aoife, we needed to get it all out there. And uh, if you have any questions regarding anything that we mentioned about Aoife or any of the products and so on, then uh, just leave us a question in the thread for this podcast in the podcast forum. And uh, moving on quickly, uh, we don't even t- have time for an ident. Steve, what's coming up at the cinema and on Blu-ray? Uh, okay, um, coming up this weekend, we have Legend, which is the story of the Cray Twins with Tom Hardy playing both the Cray Twins. Uh, we have The Gift, which is a new film from M. Night Shyamalan Ding Dong, uh, which is <laughs> co-written, directed and produced, uh, low budget apparently, so expect a twist at the end. Um, and also The Maze Runner, Scorch Trials, which is the second film in the Maze Runner series, which is another one of those young adult books, um, which I probably won't bother watching. I might go and see Legend because uh, I quite fancy that. And um, on Blu-ray this week, the big release is Fast and Furious 7, which if you haven't got yet, why not? Because um, <laughs> it's only Monday and it's only just come out. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm, I've been I've been busy buying tyres for my car and stuff. Yeah, well, I've, I've got that. I've got the first service coming up and then I've got tyres. Well, Ed, now, I expect you to have bought and watched it by next week's podcast so you can discuss it. Well, actually, do I do, um, in terms of actual useful plugs, uh, the latest and greatest monitor audio bronze 5.1 system is, is turning up for review imminently. So I suppose I ought to have a shiny new film to watch some stuff on it. So, yeah, exactly. I suppose I'll uh, I'll drag my ass down Sainsbury's see if we can get sorted out. <laughs> Come back with some potatoes and a box of eggs. Oh, well, you know I love I love food shopping anyway. So yeah, it's, it's a, you know, killed two birds with one happy stone. And on that bombshell, <laughs> Ed loves food bombshell. Yeah, we hadn't guessed Ed. Uh, right, anyway, 
Uh, did you get lots of sausage when you were in Berlin? <laughs> I've already asked that. Well, no, you say I didn't. Didn't I did have a, a, yeah, a, a problem beer. with my hotel room? Well, not a problem with the hotel room. I had a problem with the, my guests next door in my hotel room. Oh, I read uh, about that. I got back to my Bar hotel band. room. <laughs> no, I got back to my hotel room uh, on the Saturday, having been awake since three, about quarter to midnight, and was you know getting ready to go to bed. And the, the, then the couple next door um, embarked on. Some enthusiastic horizontal jogging. Lots of just noise. <laughs> and when they finally finished, because I'm not a very nice person, I gave them a really stirring round of applause and a big cheer. <laughs> um, and then everything went really awkwardly quiet. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you do, on the off chance, happen to be listening from... Wherever you are, um, I'm I'm sorry, but I was I was very tired, and I've got to be honest, it didn't sound like one of you was trying. So, yeah. You know. And on that bombshell, <laughs> uh, right? We, we we yeah, this is going to be a bumper edition. We've gone so long, um, but hopefully, it's all been on message. So my thanks to Steve Willers. That ain't a plane, that's a planet. And Ed Zelly. Somebody do something, I've got a tank on my ass. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, also bookmark 84 and sell us reviews, news and video, and leave us a rating, but only five stars on iTunes, if, <laughs> and only if, you enjoyed the show. Uh, I'm Phil, and thanks very much for listening, and we'll be back to normal next week. <laughs> <laughs>